do you decide that you should stop documenting to a certain extent because managing that information or you know getting your head around that information the amount of time that you're spending collecting that information is no longer worth it is there you know some guidelines that you use as far as how far down you go um well it my thing is yeah from my point of view, you can never have too much information. Um, this being said, you do have a valid point. There's a ridiculous amount of time spent on, on it's not so much how much information you collect, it's how many times it's replicated. Um, I like to have a consistent set of information across things. One, maybe say spreadsheet for IP addresses or a one management app for IP addresses and DNS information. Um, I saw a place that had it in bind tables a spreadsheet, and an access database, depending on who was looking at the information. So somebody had to go and enter it in all three places. None of them were tied together. Um, you, really, it, it comes down to making sure it's organized efficiently, if that makes sense. Uh, because once you get the once you get it built, I mean, when you come into an environment like again, one of the environments I've dealt with recently had absolutely no information on where they were at. It's an, and they were a fairly large environment. Um, that initial load is absolutely staggering. You'll spend three or four weeks doing that alone. Once it's in place and the the, the structure is efficiently done, it's moves, adds, and changes. Especially if you can delegate it to junior admins, and this is something junior admins are really good for. Is, uh, is just saying, hey, go put these five hosts in the table and then go update it and let me sign off on the changes before I do it. Um, if you're the only guy in the shop, you need to make sure that if you get hit by a bus, somebody else can come in and take care of it. That's usually, the, actually, that's the criteria I use. If, if I got, if, if lightning hit me or if the ceiling fell on me right now, how could they go forward on this without, without me being around? Any more questions, observations, comments, personal anecdotes? I had a question about, um, actually two things. One, um, MPLS. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Um, you mentioned MPLS earlier. Um, one of our, our, our needs is um, we've got multiple locations with similar PBX systems mm -hmm. that are capable, capable of voice over IP trunking. Yep. Um, so one of the needs that's, that's pushing some things is, is QoS. Yep. Um, currently, we have generally on each location two internet devices or two internet connections um, with Cisco VPN going between them mm -hmm. uh, for connect connectivity. Um, so Quest came back and said that we should do MPLS between all our locations. Do you have a response to that? Does that sound like a, uh, a logical thing to do? It depends on what they're meaning by MPLS. There's, 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 MPLS is a term that's, that refers to something very specific, but when a carrier comes back and says, we'll do an MPLS circuit, it means one of two things. We're either going to give you a raw thing, which you're actually going to speak the actual MPLS protocol to us, um, which is actually fairly complicated. Um, but you could do really nifty um, classes of services with it. The other one is MPLS VPN, which is actually a bit more common for most end sites. Um, and what that is, is you'll have, it'll be a TCP link between your router and their edge. And you'll be speaking, and let's say you've got, I'm assuming you're using private addresses between your sites right now. And what you'll have on one side is you'll be announcing using, believe it or not, RIP, V2, or private VGP between your router and them. It'll be speaking um, to announce the routes back in. And that's the more common implementation, and really the one you should be aiming for because it's really dead stupid easy to administer. Because once you gear, get your, you don't even have to go out and get an AS. It uses a private BGP autonomous system number, um, and there's a reserved range at the top of it to do that. And it's, it's really easy to administer because you just add a new network or VLAN on one side, it, and as long as it pushes through your routing tables onto the other, boom, it's done. What you can do, though, with this um, is because all, the, the, all their edge routers do all the heavy lifting for you. You can QoS your traffic using diff serve or just using standard QoS bits. And it will, they, will, they will prioritize that into usually one of four levels. Uh, I believe how Cisco, Juniper, and Marconi are currently doing this. And 
So you can, and, and like some of them will have a super secret fifth level for like international latency, though the numbers that Verizon for, Verizon Business was publishing for doing like latency between New York and London over their international network, if you buy their, their $75, $100 per circuit a month uh, thing, basically violates the laws of physics because they're claiming a latency lower than the speed of light will allow. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they will, again, this is where, they will massively promise you lots and lots of stuff um, that they really actually can't do, um, even if they were employing Scotty. But no, seriously, it, it, it actually worked. We, we did that we, with the MPLS VPN because we were doing exactly that at, the, at one site or at one company with, with, with point to point VoIP trunking between PBXs. We were on a frame relay network, and let me tell you, even though that frame relay network theoretically respected diff serving and certain QoSing, it was a nightmare. The overhead just made the, the call sound like a really bad analog cell phone, um, which was impressive given it's a, na a naturally digital medium. Um, when we had switched over and were doing actual QoS and prioritizing the traffic on the links, it was a night and day difference. It works out really well. And again, anytime you're going from a VPN type scenario to a private WAN type scenario, your, your things like VoIP or more real time things, the latency is going to get better. Um, just because routing traffic over the public internet via multiple providers is, you can never tell how your packets are going to get there. So, yeah. Um, unofficially, or officially, that, that sounds like a really good way to go. Unofficially, again, shop around. As, I mean, if you, if you guys can get, again, these guys are cutthroat. They will beat each other up bloody if they get any hint that you might be willing to jump ship. Go talk to another, go get your options together along those lines before you go forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to, okay. the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, as I get more into the business aspect of it, these microphones. <laughs> the, as I get more now? into the business aspect of it, I, I'm getting more involved in the contract. Um, aspect yes. of the of the okay. of the uh, adding of lines, mm -hmm. changing of lines, things like that. Um, recently, we've um, with some other hosting services, we're getting pretty much screwed on multi-year contracts. Um, we're with a hosting company right now. Mm -hmm. The management before us signed a four-year contract for for hosting. Um, turns out that hosting service sucks. So we're in our third, our first, our second year. We want to transfer. We're going to get hit with a whole bunch of stuff. So um, currently, with they want to put us on two-year, three-year contracts. Management's like, no, not going to happen. No, no more than first-year, one-year contracts. Are you? Are we seeing more people going to multi-year contracts, or people going back to one-year contracts, or what are you seeing? Um, well, just for example, the CLEC that I resell for in Michigan. Base on a T1, base contract on a T1 is three years. Um, and that trend has been going up. It used to be when it was even, even before the tech crash happened, it used to be that you, would, you could even get a six-month contract if you wanted it. Um, the last place I was at, against my advice and my manager's advice, they went with a five-year. They got a lot of really nifty perks out of it, like uh, a fiber node dropped off in our data center that we could pull whatever we wanted to off of it. If, but it was, it was captive, it was theirs. And it wasn't even the CLEX, it, or it wasn't even, the, um, I'm sorry, the ILEC, um, AT&T. It belonged to Verizon Business. So it's not like we could get access through anybody else on that node. But hey, we got some really nifty stuff out of them, but it was a five-year contract and a certain amount of dollar commit per year. The thing to remember is, with those multi-year contracts, is if you're going to do a contract that long, they will negotiate it. They will say, oh, well, here's a contract. And this is true of the big guys. You can say, okay, well, fine. I'm going to give you, if you want me to give you money for five years, this is what I want. And, you know, this is where lawyers are helpful, <laughs> seriously. Have them translate your demands into legalese, especially, like, ways of getting out of the contract. Like, if, if certain things aren't delivered, and again, this is where documentation comes into play. Every time they violate it, just start keeping track and then when they come in to say hey when next time your account reps in and say hey how things are going slide under their nose and say well you know we've been talking to our lawyers and the fact that we've been down five times in the last week means that we can go ahead and terminate the service it really is silly and stupid but you have to realize they don't care about you 
So anything that you can do to, again, turn the thumb screws down on them is the best way to go. Um, contracts are a whole, pretty much a whole different talk. I mean, I could, there's, there's, there's something I've been working on to basically be, you know, this is how you do, this is how you do a services contract, and it's, it's a good thing to know, it's a good thing to be looking at, and that's actually a good valid point that, you know, I notice I've, I've got about two minutes here, um, is don't just know the technical aspect of it. Get involved in the business. This is, it's just as important, especially if, if, if you do find yourself with managing a whole network. It is something that you can't afford to be ignorant about. So the fact that you're picking it up is, is, is a really good thing. I think I've got time for one more here. Or... Um, hey, Lou. Uh, my job title doesn't involve being involved in the network, but you, I remember you mentioned that you had some jobs of yours that turned to a nightmare. Is there anybody, any way somebody who's technical but not into networking can think ahead and specify things to make it less of a nightmare for you? I mean, what things should we be considering? Actually, that's a really good point. Um, it's one thing to say the network is slow, but again, specific details. You know, saying, hey, when we go ahead and try to FTP something across to this house, or we're doing this data interchange uh, from here to there, you know, this is, this is really not what's going well. Or we've got this application coming down the road, like if you're a your server admin or your application developer saying, hey, we're going to be shoving, you know, 10 meg TIFF files across, the, across to, you know, London every day. Um, and we're going to do like 300,000 of them. You know, then, then, they can, then we can come back and go, you've got to be out of your mind. Or, hey, this is what we can do. Or, hey, why don't we look at bumping this up, but can you do this to the application protocol? So when you've got something new coming out, blind, and this is, this is true in general, blindsiding your network admin is usually a really bad idea. They tend to get really cranky and start turning off ports. <laughs> um, Worst case scenario, you may find that your server's been moved. It's, it's pingable, but you don't know where it went. <laughs> so, but yes, actually, very good point. The more you get people involved in the loop and you do a full set of specs, and especially if you can, especially, if you, you know, the one thing I love hearing is a ticket coming in from a, saying, hey, we just deployed this thing and it broke, um, is, hey, we're going to deploy this thing. This is what we need or we think we need. Can you help us out? That's, that's really, that really helps. And because uh, you know what they say, knowing is half the battle. Thank you. Thank you.